Hi, David. Good to be back with you. Hey, Mark. How are you? Good, thanks. You've got you're on mute. Oh, oh. no, hang on. You know, you're not. I've got my sound down. <laughs> it's not you, it's me. I am. That's good. Great. So we've got people jo will be joining us shortly. Um, still are the lunch break. Imagine. How's your day? It's been a very good day. Very busy, but very good. Okay. How about you? And you good, thanks. Yeah, straight into it's boom, boom, boom sort of day, one thing after another, which is nice. Um, the how we, so how do you want to run this session? Um, is it Q and A, or do you do you have a slide deck you want to walk us through? Uh, you know, I've. I've got a couple of slides that I want to present, but then, you know, let's let's open it up early for Q&A. And if we don't get a lot of questions, then we'll just, I'll, I'll do some more slides uh, for those okay, that are great. here. So. Um, Fantastic, because it is also um, recorded. So we get a lot of people on the playback as well. So, um, so if yep. we've got a room that's a bit on the quieter side, then yeah, there'll be people watching this later. Sure. Welcome to everyone who has joined us in the room. Um, and we'll be, uh, so let's get underway actually. We're ready to start. Um, we've got David here from No Name Security. Um, so please, by all means, uh, put your questions into our chat. If you've got a question for David, and he's also kindly put his email for recording for after, after this as well to follow up with one-on-one. -on -one. David, welcome. Hey, thank you, Mark. Do you want to walk us through, tell us a little bit about why API security doesn't have to be hard, um, the no-name security view of the world of API security, and um, we'll get started. I'll, I'll let you know when we've got some questions. Sure, sure. So, you know, I think, well, first of all, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been in the security space for probably way too long. Uh, started in 1986 uh, with Air Force Intelligence here in the U.S. Uh, stayed with that organization until 1994 when we stood up the uh, Air Force Computer Emergency Response Team, where I became a contractor and, and worked in the AFCERT for uh, the next uh, three years. Uh, had three different hackers uh, or attackers uh, comp, uh, apprehended in different uh, situations. So that was kind of fun getting to uh, uh, to meet those people who were breaking into Air Force systems and interview them, interrogate them, and and find out more about what was what was bringing them into our systems. Uh, since that time, uh, I've worked with companies like Internet Security Systems and uh, Sourcefire when they were both very small startups. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here at uh, at No Name Security now. So um, with that being said, I think, you know, it's, why does the, the question, you know, why, why, why is API security so hard today is probably where we have to start. And I think one of the reasons why it's so hard is because there's this disjointed, uh, uh, there's this disjointed relationship between the, uh, the security team uh, and the developers. And we see it over and over and over again. The developers are pressured and pushed to get code out the door. Uh, I like to use the uh, analogy of, you know, it's Black Friday. You know, three days before Black Friday, we've got to have this system working. It's got to be out there. It's got to be doing its thing. Uh, we can't wait to, uh, to deploy. And so as a result, we've got to get something out there and we've got to get it out right now. And so what happens is it goes through all the testing and all those kinds of things. And if there's, you know, some vulnerabilities, well, you know, we're going to have to live with the risk that that, that, that uh, presents to itself. Uh, and, you know, the truth is every, I, I've never met a developer that wanted to produce vulnerable code. So we always want to be shifting left and we always want to be training our developers to write good code. We always want to have our infrastructure supporting good best practices uh, for, de for deploying, you know, APIs and all those kinds of things. 
But at the end of the day, we still have to have the security team involved and in knowing what is out there, what is being deployed, how it's being deployed, and, uh, and whether or not it is presenting a risk uh, to our organization. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. I think this is, oh, no, that's not the right one. I got to hit the right button. Excuse me here. You you hit the right button. So uh, while you do, welcome people who have joined us in um, our roundtable. So David's going to walk us through some slide decks. But please, if you do have any questions, um, feel free to add them at any time to chat, and we'll be able to take those. We'll make sure that um, David gives you um, a, a good a deep response to um, any questions you have. Um, so by all means, just feel free to start jumping in on that while David uh, David goes through. We'll make this a bit more interactive. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, so happy to answer any questions all the way through. But so the big reason why API security seems to be so hard today, I think is because of this disjointed relationship uh, between the developers and the, uh, uh, the security team. And let's face it, they, they talk different languages, right? Uh, the developers are into the code. The security team typically is not. They're into the packets and the payload and the malware and, and all of those kinds of things. So there's a, a giant gap there between those organizations. And so what I want to talk about today is a way to bridge that gap. Uh, we want to continually be training the team to be able to do those things, like I mentioned before. But we also want to be able to, we want to uh, enable the security team to see what has happened, to see what the development team has done and show uh, and be able to demonstrate where there's issues associated with those uh, with those APIs and communicate that effectively back to uh, the development team in such a way that it's not um, contentious. We, we want this to build a bridge between the security team uh, and the development team. And when we when we have that kind of a bridge and when we have the two-way communication and we have both the organizations working on the same path, all of a sudden API security gets a lot easier. I think that makes sense. What do you think, Mark? Absolutely. Uh, I think because I think you know often we often it's considered that the developers are the innovators and the security are the blockers who are going to actually just try to shut any creative idea that the developers have because there's a risk involved. So anything that brings them together and gets back onto this is the business goal we're trying to get is 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 great. But there needs to be that in there needs to be the platforming and tools that overcome that recognize that the, that that's the cultural divide and overcomes that. So I'm interested in hearing how you approach that. I so exactly, I think I think you hit it right on the nose, Mark. And 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 some are going to ask the question, "Why now?" In fact, I think this question was answered in some or asked in some of the uh, 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 pre uh, pre conference questions that that were that customers submitted or attendees have already submitted. And why is it important now? Why has this become a big deal in the last twelve or twenty four months? And I think you know certainly COVID had a big part to do with that, you know, working from home, even push the acceleration of APIs uh, more than it has in the past. Uh, and even before COVID, we had the, you know, the start of the digital transformation of everybody moving to the cloud and moving all of our data into the cloud meant we needed to use more and more APIs. And so the explosion of APIs in the, uh, in the environment, I think is why this is such a big deal today. APIs are absolutely mission critical. Uh, again, back to the analogy of tomorrow, or we got three days before Black Friday. Everything has to happen on a time to push revenue, to make the business go, uh, to make sure that we get things done. We, the security and the development team are in conflict, mostly because of the, the velocity at which these things have to happen. And then we've got this incredible multi-cloud, multi-environment, uh, whether it's a cloud or data center, whether it's you know the difference between uh, we've we've got customers who are utilizing at least four or five different API gateways, whether it's the cloud native gateways or whether it's a third party gateway, uh, they all are utilizing those. They use different web application firewalls. The environment is so um, diverse that that in and of itself makes the challenge even more difficult. And as a result, I think everybody would. Pretty, pretty much agree that today the APIs are the top attack vector. 
Uh, I know I meet with uh, Gartner on a regular basis and they predicted that it would be the top attack vector in 2022. And recently they said, no, we got it wrong. It's already the top attack vector. And I think we've seen from uh, the last couple of weeks or the, or the last couple of months, uh, some of the biggest uh, you know, API attacks. And, and even, I haven't got, I still should have it on this slide. I, I should have had it because it's been a couple of weeks ago now. LinkedIn uh, with 700 million uh, users uh, data being uh, compromised through an API. But all of these organizations have shift left. Well, I should say almost all of these organizations have a big investment in shift left technologies. They've got all kinds of testing capability going on. They've got uh, cataloging and API gateways and all those kinds of things in order to help uh, their shift, shift left environment. And yet on the right, they were still unprotected. There was something that was wrong in their environment that allowed for someone to compromise and gain uh, millions of, of records uh, in, in each of these particular attacks. Uh, what do you think, Mark? Yeah, I, I'm wondering, um, I think we do see this and then that that reduces the trust people have in being able to use some digital services. So that, so it actually reduces the revenue opportunities and the um, uh, business opportunities there. Just thinking for the audience, do you want to, because um, shift left is a term that's sort of come up in, in greater usage lately. Do you want to describe what shift left means? Sure. Um, so shift left is the idea of pushing a lot of the security responsibility back onto the developers in my in my mind it makes them responsible for doing good testing it makes them responsible for making sure that the deployment is done uh by security best practices it pushes all of the authentication and authorization uh back on to that team and i think part of the challenge of that is we have tried to substitute shift left for shield right. And so, oh, because we're doing all this shift left, we're trying to take care of all the security up front, that somehow all of that code's now gonna be perfectly secure and we don't have to do as much on the right-hand side. We don't have to tell the security team that this API has social security numbers or credit card numbers in it. Ah, it's already taken care of. We've already got authentication and authorization associated with it. Surely there won't be any vulnerabilities, you know, and that seems to be, and I, and I honestly don't think that's the attitude. That was probably an unfair. Uh, but at the end of the day, what happens for the security team is that those security vulnerabilities do raise their ugly head. Somebody discovers that there's a broken object level authorization vulnerability associated with this API. And that's when huge numbers of records get compromised and it could have been avoided. Uh, and Or it could have been stopped in the early stages of the uh, of the detection of that capability if we had known how to do it uh, from the start, if we had been monitoring on the right while deploying good shift left practices. So does that make sense? You, you, yeah, great. You definitely, I can see how you definitely do need both. I mean, even if you've got that shift left environment, developers are on it, and then uh, one afternoon something's got to happen, so you suddenly grant super admin privileges to to someone to be able to do one thing and then forget to ever undo the super admin privileges and then that's suddenly then a giant uh, vulnerability on your shield right side yeah yeah you know that's a really good point mark um i i talk with with CISOs all the time and i i try and position you know one of the things that we see pretty regularly as a, I know this would never happen to you, uh, Mr. Sizzo. It would never happen in your environment, but you know, an API is deployed. Uh, everything seems to be working fine. At some point in time, something changes and now there's a bug and there's, uh, there's a problem with the API. Uh, they don't have time to bring it all the way to, to pull it completely off of the, uh, the production environment. So they've got to update it. Somebody goes out to test the production environment to see why it's broken. They disable the authentication because, hey, now I can, I, I can run a whole bunch more test cases in a short period of time and figure out what the problem is. I know this would never happen to you, but that developer didn't mean to. But in testing and fixing that particular API, they did a great job, but they forgot to turn the auth authentication back on. And, uh, I, you know, it, it never happens in your environment, but 
I can tell you that it has happened and you want to know when that kind of thing happens. And they all laugh and they say, yeah, that happened to us two weeks ago, right? Or that happened to us yesterday. Uh, you know, we, we, we hear about it, you know, from the security team, you know, on a pretty regular basis when, when these kinds of issues uh, happen. You know, the other thing that happens a lot um, is as organizations are moving to the cloud, they, they have this, um, this process of, you know, of rapid deployment. They're all, everybody, uh, you know, is using an agile process, you know, and two week sprints, four week sprints, six week sprints, it doesn't matter. They're going to build and they're going to deploy something very quickly. And as a result, much, much more quickly than we used to do it in the past. And as a result, when those new things get deployed, uh, what often happens is it goes to the security team for a review. The security team has two or three days to, to analyze those changes before they determine whether or not that it meets all their security needs. And unfortunately, what uh, things get missed. And I like to use the example of somebody's adding a new application to the web environment. It's going to connect to their mobile app. And so they stand up a new EC2 instance in their AWS environment. Uh, of course, it needs a load balancer in front of it. Oh, and oh, hey, there's an EC2 instance that's already available. So we'll add it to that one. We'll give it a public IP. And now all of a sudden, we've got access to our web app uh, or our mobile app through that particular EC2 instance. But what they didn't realize was that there was another API on that on that uh, same EC2 instance that was communicating internally. And now it's exposed through that public IP address. And it's like, whoa, what happened? I couldn't see that coming. I didn't know that there was, you know, that, that that particular API would be exposed by doing that. We don't have that kind of visibility into the, they should have that kind of visibility. They should be able to identify that that particular API is already on that EC2 instance. And if we do this, then yes, we will be exposing that particular API to the public internet. That's how some of these larger, I think, uh, broken object level authorization issues happen is that APIs are exposed through routes that they didn't necessarily expect or, or anticipate uh, before the system was, was stood up uh, or even afterwards when new things are added. So common, common issue. Let me, uh, let me talk about a little uh, about our API security strategy. Uh, no name security has developed this API security strategy that we think works uh, across the board, regardless of where an organization stands with regards to their uh, capabilities uh, today from a security perspective, they can easily adopt this DART API security strategy. And the first, the four steps are discover, analyze, remediate, and test. And discover and analyze are clearly, you can't remediate and test what you don't know you have. So discover and analyze have to be the first two steps have to know what you're protecting. Where are your APIs? Are they internal? Are they external? Are they uh, exposed to the internet? Uh, are, they, are they just going between you and a partner? Uh, we did a POV with a customer not too long ago, and we discovered a number of APIs that were communicating out to partners. And the interesting part about those outgoing APIs is that they were going out via HTTP. They weren't encrypted. They weren't using HTTPS at all. And in order to log into that partner system, they were sending username and password in the first request of the API. And so it's all in clear text. We discover all of this information and we, we come back to them and say, hey, you've got a problem. You, you know, you're sending your username and password out to a partner uh, in clear text. And they said, oh, that partner never gave us an HTTPS connection, you know, never gave us the secure connection to be able, be able to do it. I wonder if we can just change it to HTTPS and it'll fix it. <laughs> yup, <laughs> that's all it took. It was just a matter of going in and changing their call and the destination of their call to an HTTPS and they were able to at least encrypt that outgoing. Had they not done that and had somebody else discovered that outgoing API, they could have placed orders and done all kinds of things on behalf of that company that they would have never had uh, control over and they would have never seen it. They would have never known that it was there. But just by doing a good discovery of what's out there, of monitoring all of the traffic and finding the HTTP and HTTPS traffic that is carrying APIs, you can see all of these kinds of things, do that kind of an analysis 
And now all of a sudden the security team through automation and those kinds of things makes their job a lot easier to secure the, to secure those APIs. I want to stop right there for just a minute, Mark, because I think maybe somebody has a question and, and also to see if, uh, what you think about that. Let, yeah, great. Uh, great point in time. Um, anyone in the room, feel free to uh, shout out with a question for uh, David. Then, So you're going to take us through the DART model, but already what you're showing there is that some of these are low-hanging fruit. So even that discovery, there's so, so there's sort of like almost two loops of the DART, isn't there? Like there's those small, those small quick fixes where you discover, analyze, you know what the remediation is and you can quickly <laughs> clear off... <laughs> some of the, uh, some of those ones and then you've got more time to focus on the bigger ones so you, are you finding even with just the discover that that's making i think there was a report around from gardner or, or one body that was talking about the need for you know the the trickiest thing isn't just the security it's the ability to respond to what the security vulnerabilities are in a timely yeah. manner yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, you, 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 you hit it on the nail. Discover is so important because you can't protect what you don't know you have. And, and oftentimes what we find is, I, I ask CISOs all the time, how many APIs does your organization manage? And the answer to that question is, I have no idea. You know, and, and I, I asked one company, uh, one CISO, how many APIs do you have? And he said, 64. I thought, wow, you answered that very confidently and very quickly. I said, how did, how did you know that? And he says, well, we have an API gateway and there's 64 APIs in that gateway. And he said, I was just looking at it today and, and I could see that information. That was kind of funny because when we got into their environment and doing a, uh, and then they're now a customer, when we were doing the proof of concept with them, we found 1,570 some APIs. <laughs> so there were a lot, you know, an order of magnitude plus uh, of APIs uh, in that environment. It was absolutely uh, eye-opening for them, very shocking that they had no idea and they didn't know what was in those APIs. And, uh, and so the interesting part about it is, is that yes, if you can get that visibility, if you can find that information, all of a sudden those first steps, it's kind of like you said, the low hanging fruit, it's easy to go in and turn the authentication back on on that API. It's easy to turn on HTTPS for that API. Uh, we see uh, in, in our analysis space, we oftentimes see somebody who's configured an API gateway without uh, turning on the OWASP policy uh, with that. And so we'll, we'll, we look at the devices within the environment and say, hey, wait, why is this particular API, uh, unlike all the others, not have the OWASP policy turned on? And the answer to that is usually that the developer who was responsible or the DevSec guy or DevOps guy who was responsible for deploying it didn't understand what the OWASP policy was, was concerned maybe about uh, latency that it might introduce or something along those lines. And so he says, ah, I'm going to leave it off and probably not a great idea. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's the kind of decision that has to be made. And then what you need to do, like you said, is remediate. How do you take care of all these things? Most of them, quite honestly, are, like you said, low-hanging fruit. Some of them are more complicated. Uh, for example, we were working with an organization uh, that in the analysis of their environment, we found over 100 uses of the uh, corporate uh, wildcard certificate. Instead of having a separate certificate for each EC2 instance in their AWS environment, they had the same certificate on every single one, it, meaning any one of those certificates gets compromised, all of their traffic, all of their, you know, information is compromised. And as a result, you know, the process to remediate that and to change a lot of those applications over to their own uh, specific certificate was going to be a little bit complicated. Uh, so it can get a little bit more complicated, but oftentimes there's a ton, like you said, of low hanging fruit that will dramatically reduce uh, the attack surface for, uh, for an attacker. Uh, so yeah, very, very important. So that remediation step again is very, very important, but finally you got to test and testing runs the entire gamut, right? We, we all know that it should be integrated with your CI CD pipeline. It should be integrated with your pre-production and your and your and your post-production systems. So being able to test APIs to identify where there are security issues, 
uh, like pen testing and, and uh, application security testing, all extremely important to this entire strategy. So even breaking this up into bits and bytes, if I'm an organization that's just getting into a security, uh, into developing a good security st structure for my organization, I want to get those uh, technologies that can do the discovery for me, that can do the analysis. And then as I grow and as I get better and better at this, uh, I may want to look at automation tools to remediate and even to test uh, those, those devices or those, those capabilities within our environment. So I think I'm coming up close to the end of our session. Is that right, Mark? You are. Um, so the so last chance for anyone who does want to have a burning question to be able to throw one in um, for us. The thing that I like about this DART approach too, and it comes back to that low hanging fruit, but pardon me, also to your comment at the beginning about overcoming that cultural cha challenge where the security and the devs are almost at loggerheads. This brings them together, but it also get those easy wins or those light touch remediations allow people to see quickly that security doesn't need to be a blocker. You can, you know, you can take actions, you can reduce the attack surface, get some runs on the board. So it seems like even just that Dart model has that opportunity to change the culture. So you're hearing from clients around that aspect of, of this approach? Yes, yes, absolutely. And and what we see in, in our deployments um, <clears throat> with our customers is that they're discovering these things early. Once they discover it, they set up the system to automatically send messages, whether it's Jira or Slack or ServiceNow, however, back to the development team that has all of the information that we discovered. So we can show them, look, we saw this request, we saw this response, this is where the differences are and where the challenges are. And now I can point you directly to what has to be fixed in order to make this more secure. And instead of it being, hey, we got hacked and the, the, the CISO got you know, punched in the face and now he's got to go be upset and angry with the development team, we can ahead of time send all of that information so that they have everything that they need in order to fix it before that attack surface actually gets attacked. And so much, much, much cleaner. Uh, it's that bridge of communication that I think we've been lacking uh, all the way through. And by integrating the test with the security team's information, the pre-production team, the DevOps team, even the DevSecOps team can be running those tests and sharing that information all through the same UI uh, back with the security team, giving them a confidence that what's getting deployed uh, is either secure or they know exactly where the vulnerabilities are and they can watch to make sure that those don't get exploited. I might be willing as a security guy to say, okay, I know it's important you guys get this out. I'm okay with you deploying it because I know there's a vulnerability, but I also know how to specifically remediate that vulnerability in real time. And so, yep, there's a vulnerability associated with uh, uh, excessive data exposure. Uh, but I know how to do. I know how to take care of that. I know how to block the source IP. I know how to, you know, revoke the user's credentials. And I can do that if they try and and take advantage of that particular uh, exploit of that attack Fantastic. surface. Fantastic. Thanks, David. Um, and I see your uh, email is up there, so people can reach out. Um, great to have this time to talk with you again. And thanks for walking us through the model. Hey, my pleasure. And thanks for the time, Mark. Um, again, yeah, reach out to me at David T at No Name Security. Uh, happy to uh, to talk with any of y'all. Okay, thanks, and enjoy the rest Thank of you. your conference. Cheers, ciao. Bye bye.